I'm Marty Ritchie. I work here at SRI um, and uh, would like to say good evening and welcome. Uh, as you know, may know, this is our last event for 2013. We don't have events in December, so um, thank you all for coming. And I know that several of you have attended at least some events this year. Um, and have, I hope you have found our get-togethers informative and worthwhile. Uh, a reminder that you can find videos of past events on our YouTube channel, um, for which you can get the URL on the little bookmarks on the table out as you leave, has our social media channels, including our YouTube address. Um, I'd also like to be the first, hopefully, to welcome you, a, or to wish you a great holiday season, since we won't be seeing you in December. Um, we will be announcing our upcoming speakers on the Cafe Sci website and via email to subscribers. So if you haven't signed up for getting the Cafe Sci email, please do so. And we're also always looking for great speaker suggestions. So you can find me if, uh, if you have any to share. So on to tonight's event. We are pleased to have Ian Colerain, PhD, a senior director in SRI's Center for Health Sciences, join us to discuss his research on human sleep and its effects on the brain as we age. Dr. Colerain is an internationally recognized leader in research on sleep, the brain, and alcoholism. His research has been published broadly and has markedly changed how we think about sleep and consciousness. Dr. Colerain received his PhD in psychophysiology with specialization in sleep from the University of Tasmania in 1987. So without further ado, let's ask Dr. Colerain to come up to the podium. Ian. <laughs> you remember. Bonsoir. Bienvenue. I, I, I was... Um, debating whether I do the whole thing for Café Scientifique in an outrageous French accent. <laughs> Having graduated from an outrageous French accent school, <clears throat> but I'll, I'll do it in an Australian accent instead. Um, so it, it's really uh, wonderful to see so many people coming out. Um, it seems much later than it is. I, I'm still, I got back from Australia last week and it's sort of going into summer, so it, it, it seems like we're in the middle of winter here when it gets dark at, at 5 o'clock. Um, we do a, a number of, of different things here at SRI International in the Human Sleep Lab. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit of it tonight about the work that we've done in, in normal aging. Um, we also study obstructive sleep apnea, and that'll get a mention. We study sleep problems in alcoholism, um, which are incredibly prevalent and insidious and long-lasting and play a role in... Uh, leading to relapse because alcoholics uh, have sleep problems and they know that if they drink, they'll help them go to sleep, so then they start drinking again. Um, we'll talk tonight a little bit about the work on sleep in adolescence. Fiona Baker was here about 14 months ago or so, uh, talking about sex differences in sleep, and, and she runs our program in Sleep in Women. Um, but tonight, I want to talk about sleep in, in normal adult aging, sleep in adolescence, how sleep changes reflect brain changes. And because I figure some of you might have one or two grandchildren. Um, the, 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 just, a, just a feeling. Um, the, the, I, I will play, put a little bit of time to give you some ammunition to use against your grandkids as to um, why they need to get a good night's sleep. Although I always did everything my grandmother told me to do. So. So uh, mammals and birds have a, a, a very well-developed nervous system and they display certain types of brain electrical activity um, uh, which we can use to measure sleep. And the two distinct types that are very useful are high voltage slow waves. They're called slow waves because they take, uh, there's only two or three of them a, a second. High voltage because as you'll see um, later so in some of the children we're looking at, we, we're producing or measuring uh, EEG voltages of around um, half a volt. You know, we should be plugging these kids back into the grid at night, you know, charging electric cars. Um, and the other distinctive type is, is this desynchronized, almost wake-like type of brain electrical activity called, uh, associated with rapid eye movement sleep. Um, there are a couple of features uh, that we know in, across mammalian species. REM sleep time, you know, until this afternoon this, sli this slide said is inversely proportional to brain maturity at birth. 
um, I found a paper today that I was hoping to use, get a figure from to support this that um, actually refuted the fact that it's inversely proportional to brain maturity of birth. Science changes and moves on. So I'm now saying it may be, there's some evidence to suggest that animals that are very mature um, don't have much REM sleep. Baby deer gets born, within minutes it's eating your roses, doing what <laughs> deers are supposed to do, right? Um, baby humans get born and uh, 40 years later they're still living in your basement and <laughs> you have to feed them. Um, and what we do know is that total sleep time is inversely proportional to body size. Now this is across species, not within humans. So big humans don't sleep less than small humans. Uh, but if you look across different species, it, you know, there are exceptions to this as, as you get with all scientific data. But generally speaking, the larger animals sleep less than the smaller animals, with the giraffe being the least likely to, to sleep. We know that, that sleep is driven by two quite distinct processes, um, which were named by uh, Alex Bourbay in Switzerland, process C for circadian and process S for sleep. As you'll see throughout the talk, uh, sleep researchers are not the most imaginative people. Okay, so C, yes. Uh, and, th and these combine to give you um, your normal daily rhythm of sleep and sleepiness. And it's, it's optimal for everybody when those two processes are in synchronization. So you can see here that the, the red curve is uh, the process S curve, and it's an exponential increasing function. So as you um, stay awake, your pressure to go to sleep increases. Sleep, the sleep process builds up, and then when you're asleep, it decreases. And then there's this circadian rhythm, which is normally measured with a, with a body temperature rhythm, which goes up and down and maps onto alertness or arousal. So the I, I, ideal situation is that you are trying to uh, wake up when you're, uh, because your uh, sleep propensity has been diminished by sleep at, at a time when your body temperature cycle is helping you to be alert. Now, those of you who have travelled across multiple time zones will know what it's like when you're trying to sleep uh, out of sync with your body temperature rhythm or where your rhythm is out of sync with, with local clock time. It's called jet lag. You, you end up um, in, in a bad situation. Um, slight spoiler alert, adolescents are essentially in a constant state of social jet lag. Okay. And it's not entirely their fault. Just, just a little bit. Um, we, we know some things about the function of sleep. I went to a conference once uh, when I was, I was in sleep research. I got out of it for reasons of needing to find gainful employment. Got back into it again. Uh, and I went to a conference. And all of the, the major players of, of sleep research, some of the, 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 the grand old men, and they were all men of sleep research, were up on the stage. And, and the, this breakfast symposium was... You know, seven or eight hundred people in the audience. And it was, the, the title of the symposium was, What's the Function of Sleep? Now, I knew I didn't know what the function of sleep was, but I figured they would. And it turned out they didn't either. Okay, so we, we know some things that happen when you go to sleep. We know that energy is restored and conserved. And this is important. If, you ever, if you've ever tried to stay awake for two or three days on the trot, you, you end up very fatigued and your energy levels are low. We know it's important for brain development, particularly in children. Uh, it may even be important for brain cooling. Our body temperature drops a couple of degrees. When you go to sleep, your cerebral metabolic rate drops down, your brain cools off a bit. And it's probably got a lot to do with memory consolidation, and there's a huge amount of work being done um, on that at the moment. Um, locally, within brain circuits, it's probably facilitating that memory consolidation and other forms of learning by maintaining uh, the synaptic connections. You tend to have, um, as you'll see, use it or lose it phenomena in the brain. So if you've got a synapse connection between neurons and you're using that all the time, it will be strengthened and stay. If you don't use it, it, it gets lost and, and disconnects. Um, and both non-REM and REM sleep. So again, sleep researchers not being very imaginative. I talked to you about REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. What do you call the sleep you're having when you're not having rapid Eye movements, you call it non-rapid eye movement sleep. 
it would be good for something. So if you were to come to the sleep laboratory, we would stick things on you. Uh, they would be measuring brain electrical activity, the electroencephalograph. We'd also be measuring muscle activity, normally by measuring activity under the chin, uh, also on the legs. Um, and also uh, the electric activity associated with the eyes. It turns out that there's a positive charge. You know, I always, I've got a 50% chance of getting this right. Either the cornea is negatively charged relative to the retina or the other way around. But for most of us, fortunately, when you move one eye, the other one moves with it. Not everybody but most people. So if you move your eyes left, you end up, and you have electrodes on either side of the eyes, you end up with a positive uh, near one electrode and a negative near the other. So you can actually monitor where the eyes are, uh, are and how rapidly they're moving. Um, this is an example of uh, some of those signals in wakefulness. The top line is brain electrical activity. See if I can get a pointer. Oops. Um, and th this is 30 seconds worth of data. We do it old school. Is it going to work? Yes. 30 seconds worth of data. And you can see there are lots of, uh, of high, lots of waveforms here. So high frequency activity, the person's very much awake. The eyes are moving, fair amount of muscle tension, and there's an EKG signal um, uh, ticking along the bottom quite nicely. Uh, this is non-rapid eye movement sleep. This is a, a, a middle-aged adult. Um, the, the frequency of the EEG is, has slowed right down. The amplitude has dramatically increased. Uh, these aren't actually eye movements. These are contamination into the eye movement channel from the EEG. The muscle tension's dropped, and you can tell that because now you can see the EKG signal contaminated in the, the muscle tension. Uh, we, we know that, that slow wave sleep, this very slow, very large activity, is incredibly important across mammalian species. How do we know that? Well. Because some animals have developed the capacity to have it one hemisphere at a time. So if you're a seagoing mammal and you need to have your slow wave sleep, um, you will have it on your left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of the brain will be awake and then it will switch. Um, some seagoing mammals that are also land going mammals will do this when they're at sea but then resynchronize the two halves of the brain when they're on shore. Now, this is an incredibly expensive um, thing to do in terms of uh, e evolutionary adaption, if you think of the complexity that you need to build into a system to do this. So it has to be important. Um, some ducks do it as well. Okay. Um, rapid eye movement sleep, you, you go back to brain activity that looks a lot more like it was when people were awake. These are these uh, rapid uh, eye movements. They're saccadic eye movements. The type of eye movements you have when you're reading. So the, the, the best guess is that what you're doing is actually examining the visual scene that you are experiencing in your dream. You're actually moving your eyes around and, and, and looking at the dream, essentially. Um, the muscle tension is, is very low, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. So what, one, one thing that happens when you go into to rapid eye movement sleep for most people is that you hyperpolarize all the muscles in your body, all the major postural muscles. So you're disconnecting the brain from the muscles. Anybody want to give me a guess as to why that would happen? Yes. So you don't act out your dreams. Could be a good thing. Could be a bad thing. More often than not, it's a bad thing. But it's important to do that. So you end up, um, oh, sorry, this is, those of you at the front may be able to see the eyes actually moving under the lids. If, if, if you have access to a baby, Please don't go and steal one for the purpose, but if you actually have access to a baby, um, babies sometimes sleep with their eyes partly open, and you can see the, the, the eyes flicking around quite, quite easily. Uh, muscular paralysis is very common. Um, when I was much younger and had a small child, um, I had a party trick that I do with my oldest daughter. Um, I would wait for her to go into REM sleep, and then, then we would do a puppet show together because she would be entirely floppy, so I could move her arms around, <laughs> that sort of thing. It was, it, it was great until my wife threatened to call child services. <laughs> um, the muscular paralysis is, can be extremely apparent. So cats go to sleep curled up normally, and then you'll see them, them, them stretch out, or dogs will do the same. Then you'll see the paws flicking. 
well, if, if you were to look closely, the eyes will be moving at the same time as the, 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 the paws are moving. Um, can lead to some fairly uncomfortable sleeping positions. And, but I'm fairly confident that that baboon is in, in, is in REM sleep. So, so what happens if you, if you don't disconnect the body from the brain? Well, you act out your dreams. And this was shown uh, by a, a, a real Frenchman with a real French accent called Jouvet in Lyon um, in the 60s who discovered the bit of the brainstem that is responsible for disconnecting the muscles from the brain. And he lesioned that. He took it out. So then you ended up with animals who would act out their dreams. Now, you have to take my word for it, but this little cat is asleep for the entire time of this, this movie. It's just a few seconds of clip. It repeats. And, you know, probably the animal is, is dreaming about chasing something or <laughs> something. But nonetheless, asleep the entire time. Um, th this uh, becomes a problem with, with a human disease called REM behaviour disorder, where people start to act out their dream content. Um, uh, the, there are a number of high-profile lawsuits where people have used REM behaviour disorder or sleep um, acting out their dreams as, as a defence, where they've been uh, involved in sexual assaults or physical assaults. Um, the guy who, who first really pointed this out, worked in Minnesota, and he had a patient who had badly frostbitten feet because um, he climbed out of bed in the middle of the night, climbed out of the window, went walking in the snow for several hours, and then came back, had no memory of it, was asleep the entire time. What's diff very different to sleepwalking, we'll talk about that in question time if you like, um, and the first thing he knew about it was his frostbitten feet the next morning. So, um, how much sleep do you need? That, that changes as a function of where you are in lifespan development. Um, the red line is the, essentially the total amount of sleep that you, you need across a 24-hour period. The, 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 the blue line here is how much REM sleep you have, so the difference between the two is how much non-REM sleep you have. And you can see that babies um, sleep a lot. You sort of probably knew that already. Um, they don't tend to sleep in one consolidated lump. They have sort of you know, multiphasic sleep across um, the 24-hour period, normally time to be most inconvenient to the parents. Um, and, and then by about age uh, seven or eight, you're, you're down to maybe 10 hours of sleep a night. Uh, and then that declines very gradually over the lifespan. Um, this is the, the title that you typically see in a textbook associated with this figure. This is a figure actually drawn from a 1961 science paper. Um, but I'm wondering if a better title would be how much sleep do you get? Because we really don't know how much sleep you need. All we can measure is how much sleep people get. And everybody's going to vary as a function of of how much sleep they need. I, I used to teach very large undergraduate classes, 500, 600 kids. And you could ask them, you know, start putting your hands up if you need five hours sleep a night. And there will be some hands up. And then, you know, if you kept it going, most hands would be going up around eight or nine hours a night. And then there were still our arms going up at, at 11 or 12 hours a night. So sleep needs on a normal curve for adults um, you know, middle-aged adults, although my definition of middle-aged is creeping up. <laughs> I now consider myself middle-aged and thus I'm going to live to 110. Um, <clears throat> but middle-aged adults need, a, on average, about eight hours of sleep a night, plus or minus an hour. So that means, you know, 50% of adults are going to need somewhere between seven and nine hours a night. But 25% are going to need less than seven and 25% are going to need more than nine. So this becomes particularly important when you're talking about ageing because your sleep may get less. You may get less sleep. You may need less sleep. Okay. There may be a normal developmental change. Um, 